Good morning, Revive. First of all, we just want to say we really miss you. Um, we are here at the church filming, and it's just sad not having you guys here with us. So we really miss, miss being able to see you each week, and we hope that we're going to be able to see you again soon. Um, we've been able to see some of you out in the community in the past week, just volunteering and serving in different areas, and we are so grateful for you guys, um, especially grateful for Chemo, who came through with all of those meals to be distributed up here at the church last week. I think we gave away like 600 chickens and bags of potatoes and um, just thank you, Chemo, for coming through on that and for everybody who just continues to look for those ways that they can serve in the community. Um, this week, we're going to offer something new. We want to start kind of a virtual prayer web. So we're going to ask you guys to send us your prayer requests, things that we can be praying for for your families. Um, just send those to staff at GoRevivechurch.com, and we're going to send those out to the church so we can all be in touch and know what's going on and what we can be praying for each other and ways that we can be serving each other. And we're also going to try to start some new kind of live stuff on YouTube and Facebook just to be in touch with you guys and just be able to be interacting during this time. So we hope to see you in those spots this week and have a great week. Good morning, Revive Church. We're going to worship from your homes this morning. Let's lift up the name of the Lord this morning and remember how good he is in our lives and in all the lives around us. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Of the goodness of God, I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in the darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend, and I have lived. In the goodness of God. God. A great way to share our faith is simply to tell people about how you've seen God at work. We've all seen God at work, whether it's in our revived family or with our extended families or our churches or our homes or our workplaces. Our God is good. He's good in every part of our life. Let's just keep that in mind as we finish out our worship this morning. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself 
been light And darkness tries to hide And trembles at his voice Trembles at his voice How great is our God Sing with me how great is our God and all will see how great, how great is our God. And age to age he stands, and time is in his hands, beginning and the end. Beginning and the end The Godhead three in one Father, Spirit, Son Lion and the Lamb Lion and the Lamb How great is our God Sing with me how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. You're the name above all names. You are one. Well, we're just going to jump right into the text for today. So if you have your Bibles, open them up. Or if you have a smartphone, go to the Revive Church app or BibleGateway.com. Any way you can get it in front of you is going to be good. So open up to Matthew 7, um, verse 21, and we'll be in a couple verses there. This is Jesus speaking. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Verse 22, Many will say to me on that day, again, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Verse 23, Then I will tell them plainly, hear this, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. Not exactly a fun passage. And um, what we find in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, is that Jesus is teaching practically, but then it plays out in the rest of Scripture. So we can see an example of this in Acts 19. So let's go there to see a real-life showing of what Jesus was just talking about. Acts 19, 13 through 16 says this, Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, In the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Verse 14, Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish priest, were doing this. One day, the evil spirit answered them. So they were trying to drive out this evil spirit, and one day, the evil spirit actually talked back to them, and this is critical what, what it says. Jesus I know, and Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered him. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. 
I know these are intense verses, but trust me, in this journey over the next few minutes, we're going to find a deeper walk with Christ. What we're talking about today is the gap and not the clothing company because it's closed anyways, right? The gap between knowing about Jesus and knowing him experientially, working without relationship and joining him in his work. We all have some sort of gap where we're not where we need to be in our relationship. And this message is not to guilt anyone, but to encourage us along this journey. What we're going to talk about today might be a little bit uncomfortable, especially since you're, I assume, you're on the couch at home, like you're in your regular environment. We're going to talk about how to break generational cycles. We all have them, even if we were raised in the best of homes, which is not most of our story, right? We still have things that we have got to let go. We all have them, some good, some bad. Here, I'll prove it to you. And I don't want to get too personal because I don't think I could handle it in my own life. But I was formed in an environment that instilled many things. Here's some. How I view women. How I raise my kids. How I drive my car. How I earn money and spend it. How I protect my family. How I use my words for good or bad. How I eat my food. How I live socially. How I work hard or not how I read my Bible, view the church, give generously or not, and on and on. We all have things about us that need to change, stuff that was embedded deep in our life. Here, check this out. So if you're a Christian, hopefully this will make sense to you. This is really the thought for the message today. Jesus might be in your heart, but grandpa is in your bones. Meaning, That we all have generational cycles, stuff that's put in us that will naturally play out. And as we give Jesus complete authority to have his way in our life, we can become who we were originally designed to be by Jesus, only taking and using the good stuff. John 10.10 really speaks to this. We've been looking at this over the last few weeks. It says that the enemy has one mission. It's to steal, kill, and destroy But Jesus came to bring us or offer us life and life to the full or life abundantly. And when we dig into that text, what we find is this this view of taking hold of the life that Jesus offers us. And so if you today want to grab hold of the life that Jesus has for you, this is for you. To truly become a new creation in Christ. In Matthew 7, and that's where we're at today, Jesus is closing out the Sermon on the Mount. He's sitting on the side of a mountain, talking to his followers, the crowd, which is the spiritually curious, and the opposers. And he's doing it all at the exact same time. And it's beautiful. He takes a moment to say, it's possible, it's possible to actually be around me and completely miss it, to know about me and to be off. Acts 19 shows us that Paul was noted as one who knew and followed Jesus. But those who were seemingly calling Jesus Lord, Lord, which really means master or the one who guides and the one who was trying to drive out demons, it said that, man, Jesus didn't even know him away from him, those evildoers. So here's the thought. It's the difference between being and doing. A few weeks ago, um, we looked at our calling uh, in a message out of Matthew called Salt and Light that we as Christians are called to preserve the truths of Jesus and bring flavor to the world and and distill darkness and to be light in the name of Christ is a beautiful, helpful message for all of us. We answered these questions about our purpose because to be that salt and light, we've got to understand who we are. And so these questions about purpose really kind of drove down into the depths of who we are and what we're trying to do. So the first one was this, who am I created to be? It's a design question. The second one is a purpose question. What am I created to do? What am I specifically designed and created to do? And the third one is a position question. Where am I created to go do it? Where am I to go do it? And we looked into this sweet spot where you can answer with confidence all three of those things. Out of that, hopefully, we kind of grounded ourselves in this calling. And here's the thought is that I, you, if you're a Christ follower, I'm a disciple, meaning a learner, follower of Jesus, to take the fullness of Jesus, everything that we know and experience and know to be true about Christ, and we take that wherever we are, 
And so right now, many of us are in our homes because we're asked to do that to avoid the spread of the virus. And so when we think of how are we going to be a Christian on purpose in this time of quarantine? Well, we'll talk about that here in a second, but it's wherever you're at. So you got to be a learner follower of Jesus, taking the fullness of Christ right here in your home with your family, with those that you can call or reach out to. We have no excuse in even these times. And so that's all about being a follower of Jesus, which is before and it's deeper than the doing. The being is essential. See, Jesus does a transformative work in all of us. I mean, he really changes us from the inside out. And he speaks about this in Matthew 7. So we were just at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. We're just going to back up a touch. Here in verse 16, it says this. It says, By their fruit you will recognize them. It says, Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? If you're not into those things, the answer is no. <laughs> Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Verse 20, thus by their fruit you will recognize them. Simply put, when we become who Jesus invites us to become, we can only bear good fruit. It's all we can offer. Now I know that there's some pushback on that. Like if you're really paying attention, you're like, Alex, right now, I'm not feeling it. I don't know if I'm giving out good fruit. I don't know if I'm filled with the joy and satisfaction and love of Jesus that's just spilling over. But doesn't it just say here that if we're filled with Jesus, if we're a Christian, man, if we're in Christ, then we can do nothing but bear good fruit. And so you might be a little down, it might be a little frustrated, but you are a life giver because of the life that Jesus has given you. So the question is, do you want to become a Christ follower? Deeper, deeper we go. Deep change, real change, the power to only keep the good stuff from grandpa in your bones. We're going to look at the pace of Jesus. So when I read scripture, uh, my natural tendency is to kind of track with Jesus' followers or sometimes even Jesus to see, like, could I hang with this guy? And the thought is always the same. No, like it's too intimidating. He's just too awesome. His followers are just so dedicated. And maybe you feel like that. But the reality is that the 12 that followed Jesus around, and especially the three, Peter, James, and John, Jesus was constantly trying to slow them down. We're going to talk about the pace of love here for a second. There was a, a Japanese theologian named Kohama, is my best guess on his last name. He wrote a book called A Three Mile an Hour God. In it, he says this, love has its speed. It is a different kind of speed from the theological speed to which we are accustomed. It goes in the depth of life at three miles per hour. It is the speed we walk, and therefore the speed the love of God walks. See, Jesus changed the world at three miles per hour. Here, I'll prove it in John 9, 1. It says, as he went along, Jesus and his followers were close behind. He saw a man blind from birth. He wouldn't have seen that in a car. He wouldn't have seen that on his phone. He wouldn't have seen that in the busy pace of our everyday life. He would have missed it. I mean, right now, and I'm fighting it too, I'm with you on this. I mean, this social lockdown thing is really uncomfortable. And it goes against a lot of how we build community, creating new ways of having to do that. But one thing I do know is we talk a lot about the busy pace of our life. Well, we have a chance to slow down. And if Jesus changed the world at three miles per hour, I think we can follow suit and slow our pace a bit. We need to do this. So here's the question that hopefully will kind of cause some conversation in your home. When does Jesus have your complete attention? Let me ask it again. When does Jesus have your complete attention? Many of us are trying to find a new normal um, through this time, and it's hard. It's hard because there's a lot of distraction and there's fear in this and there's constant have to go back to the word, back to prayer to try to center ourselves. 
But in our day, when does Jesus have our complete attention? Time to do his work in your life, to slow down and help you see what he sees while he transforms your heart. My hope, my prayer, my guidance for you is that you allow Jesus to do his transformative work in your life, that you wouldn't just do a bunch of Christian stuff without the heart to become a Christ follower. I hope that over this time, these 30 days or however long this lockdown is, that we develop some new rhythms or like even a new life in Christ that when everything does change back, we'll have a deeper walk with Christ, a slower pace, maybe actually learn something through this. And our community would be blessed because we're life givers and people that are filled with the peace of Jesus. So find the peace, find the new life as we cling to the new life that Christ offers us, salvation and a purpose. Let's pray. Um, God, I would just ask you that you would do your transformative work continually in our heart today, that we would truly become Christ-like, that we would slow down. This time is forcing that. So I just pray that we wouldn't fight that in our souls that we would recognize that the Savior of the world changed everything at three miles per hour. God, you are, are so good. I, I pray those passages in Matthew 7 and Acts 19 never be said about any one of us, that we would claim that we are your followers and you would say, away from me, you evil doer, but that we would be about the work of the Father, spreading the good news, showing the love of Christ, caring for our own, making sure that we give you our complete attention. God, make today a changing day. We ask these things in the name and power of Christ. Amen. Hi, uh, good morning, Revive. This is Thomas with Revive. And uh, these times call for a little bit of different things. So we're going to um, ask that you give online in our app. You know, God loves a cheerful giver. So, you know, he blesses us when we give. Uh, we also will ask that uh, you do communion with your family at home. You know, break the bread that represents his body that was broken for us. Also, drink the juice that represents his blood. You know, if you believe that he died for your sins and he's your savior. And uh, thirdly, pray. There's a lot of things going on right now and uh, prayer is probably the most powerful thing that we could be doing for each other. Thank you.